in. And that's it, that's all it is. <laughs> so I wanted to make a film about my lion research in Southern Africa for quite a while now. Unfortunately, I am no longer based in Africa. And on top of that, while I was there, I kind of had my hands full. <laughs> So we're going to have to be a bit creative. So that's me. I want to take you back a few years to 2010. I was working in the Okavango Delta. And the Okavango is a beautiful wildlife rich area surrounded by Kalahari Desert. I was lucky enough to drive around looking at all the wildlife. But one day I was talking to some friends in the bar and they told me that they just didn't know how many lions there were. So that got me wondering, what else don't we know about the lions in this area? So I spent a bit more time driving around, chatting to locals, <laughs> safari guides, Blimey! local fishermen, Arr pretty much anyone I could think of. Everyone I spoke to had strong ideas about lions. It's not surprising that we don't know exactly how many lions there are. They're surprisingly difficult to count. What is perhaps more surprising is that we don't have any idea how they use this vast landscape, how the roads affect them, how the cattle affect them. We simply just don't know how lions use this landscape. And for me, this is a fascinating question. If we know how a lion uses the landscape, we can help protect it by managing the way that we as humans use the landscape. We can stop conflict potentially with people. As you can imagine, lions and, and farmers don't get on very well. So if we know that lions are trying to move through areas where there are lots of cattle, perhaps we can invest in ways to help protect people's cattle from the threat of lions. If we don't know how lions use the landscape, we simply cannot help them. So I spent some time thinking about how to investigate the movement of lions on a huge scale. Now the obvious thing would have been to put some radio tracking collars on a whole lot of lions. The trouble with that is these collars, they're not cheap. They're a thousand, two thousand, maybe even more per collar. And if I wanted to know what was happening to lions across this whole area, I'd need 100, 200 collars. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars, which I, I really don't have. And on top of that, not all those lions are gonna move. Some of those lions may not go anywhere. And so those collars will simply have been wasted. Lions won't necessarily move every year. I might have to wait five, six years before a lion decides to, to disperse out of its natal territory. So collars simply weren't gonna work. So what happened? I turned to genetics. Let me show you how I did that. So here we have a map of my study area and you can see the Okavango Delta. Now the Okavango Delta is this stunning landscape of wetlands and islands teeming with wildlife, but it's dominated by the water. And in this area, lions are well known to hunt um, and thrive in this wetland landscape. And the Okavango Delta is surrounded by dry Kalahari sands. Lots of lions, uh, much lower density of lions, but there's still plenty of them there. So how do we go about looking at how lions are moving across this landscape? If you imagine that we find a lion here on Chiefs Island, the central island of the Okavango Delta, and then we find another lion over here that is related, it's a descendant of that first lion, maybe a son we know that there must have been some movement between these two lions for them to be so far apart. And if that second lion then found a mate and had offspring, and the offspring were found over here, there again must have been movement. And if we can calculate this for lots of lions, we can begin to understand where lions move in this landscape, and what pathways they have of movement. And more importantly, we can start to see where they are not moving, what parts of the landscape they're not moving through and across. And that can help us understand what in the landscape is stopping lions moving. Is it roads, is it um, cattle farming, or is it something perfectly natural that isn't, isn't a human element of the landscape? So I knew how I was gonna find out how these lions were moving across the landscape, and I knew the science behind it, 
But what I didn't really know was exactly how to get DNA from lions. It's not as if you can walk up to a lion and pull some hair from its tail and take that to the lab and get DNA. You'll simply get eaten. What I ended up doing was using a biopsy dart system. And what a biopsy dart does is it takes a tiny, tiny chunk of a lion's skin and then drops to the ground. So the dart itself is painted bright pink so that you can find it. There's my skinny legs. And it's fired in this slightly um, overzealous looking uh, dart rifle, which is powered by high pressured carbon dioxide, a bit like a paintball gun. And the biopsy dart itself cuts a disc of, of skin and it has a needle running down the middle with barbs on it. And those barbs grab hold of the skin and then the impact of the dart causes it to bounce off and land on the ground. We're not sedating the lions, we're simply taking a small chunk of tissue, usually from the rump or from the shoulder. And you'll see here when I dart this lion, I'm darting it in its rump and it will jump, but then it will do what lions normally do, is it will just kind of relax and go back to sleep. In fact, quite often I would dart lions and they wouldn't react at all. Uh, Ryan, did you guys win? Yeah, darts in. We're just gonna see if they move off a little bit so we can go and collect the dart up. Um, it's hiding in the grass somewhere. Now the hard bit, once you've darted a lion, is that you then have to collect the dart that is lying on the ground somewhere. That's it, hey, success. And that's it, that's all it is. <laughs> Done and dusted. Done and Once I'd collected the dart, it's a simple matter of unscrewing the head of the dart and then dropping the, the piece of tissue, the piece of skin, into a little vial that contains a special fluid that preserves the DNA and stops it getting badly damaged. To be kept in the dark and taken. So once I had the skin, I now had to extract the DNA. And to extract the DNA, I took the sample to the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology, to the lab of Daniel Terry. Dada wielded her magic and extracted DNA that we could then sequence and compare all of the lions to each other and start to really analyse what was happening with the lion population across this huge area. Okay, so we darted a load of lions, we got their DNA, and we've done a load of analysis. But what exactly have we found out about all these lions? Everyone thought it was going to be something to do with people. The fact that lions and cows don't get along very well, and when that happens, well, people kill the lions. But that's not what we found. It turns out that the lions of this region are divided into two distinct groups. And these groups are separated both spatially, they live in different parts of Botswana, but also genetically. And that was quite amazing. What was even more amazing is that one group of lions thrives in the wetlands of the Okavango Delta, whereas the other one thrives in the deserts of the Kalahari. They don't really mix, a tiny bit, but really not that much. So what does this mean? Unsurprisingly, if you're a lion and you've learned to live in a wetland landscape with loads of game, easy hunting, you're not going to do so well in a desert where there's just not much food. On the other hand, if you're a desert lion and you've learned how to hunt in the deserts and you encounter deep water and buffalo swimming in the water, you're not going to have a clue how to hunt in that area. Over millions of years, this evolves into genetic differences between wetland lions and dryland lions. So why does any of this matter? Well, most importantly, it shows us that the patterns that we see with endangered species are not always the result of human interference. Instead, they may in fact be a part of evolutionary adaptation, where one group of animals has um, evolved to survive better under specific circumstances, in the case of lions, the wetland, or the dryland. Now, all this does not mean that people are not having an impact on these lions. Certainly we are, and we do. What it means is that the patterns that we see 
are more as a result of natural occurrences and natural adaptation to differences in the environment than they are as a result of um, fragmentation that people have caused through roads or hunting or anything along those lines. This could easily change with increased pressure from growing human populations and such diversity that we see in the lion population and of course in many other populations really needs to be preserved if we are to allow species, particularly endangered species, to survive the pressures caused by a growing human population. I hope you enjoyed that video and I hope it was informative. Um, if it was, please like, subscribe and if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll try and answer any that you have. Um, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.